unceasing pursuit of justice for the less fortunate among us. Michael holds the Confederate Medal and the Confederate or, and the Queen Elizabeth Golden Jubilee Commemorative Medal. Please uh, join me in welcoming Michael Harris. so slipshod and so unjust that it could unravel that fast. And uh, believe it or not, what started out as an investigation to try to find out who had done that killing ended 27 years later, with Marshall being denied the $2 million that he was finally awarded after two and a half royal commissions looking into his case. Um, and the last communication I had with Junior before he died, he, he called me Coach. And he said, Coach, they won't give me the money because I'm an Indian. 
give me a stipend per month because I think I'll waste the money. Can you please help me to get the money because I'm dying and I would like to give that money to my wife and my son. And uh, sad to say, he, Donald died of a, after having a double lung transplant and never did get his justice. But that's a story that had ramifications across the country. It changed the approach to wrongful prosecution cases. Um, and uh, it started with a talk with somebody who made a claim. The second the story that I want to tell you a little bit about is the Mount Cashel story, probably the toughest one that I've ever worked on, given what the crime was against children. And in that case, I received a phone call from a waiter. And he said to me, why, why did the boys of Mount Cashel get no justice? I had no idea what he was talking about. And I said, who are you? He said, my name is Shinger. I'm a waiter at the Radstock Motel. I said, when do you get off your shift? Five o'clock. So at five o'clock, I went over and had tea with this waiter. And he told the whole story of what had happened to him. And that set off the investigation uh, into uh, what became a huge international story that affected the Irish Christian brothers around the world in seven or eight countries, including Australia and their own home country of Ireland. Um, and in the case of uh, Shane, I did what I do with all the people that come to me and ask to look at their cases. I ask this question. What is success for you? What do you want from me? And what would make you satisfied that all the effort that I'm going to put you through is worth it? And Shane said to me, I would like the people who did this to us boys put into jail. I would like to see the boys who were sexually and physically abused at Mount Cashel for a 20 year period recompensed in some way so that they could start again. It will not fix things, but it might think, make things a little easier than they, than they uh, they are right now. And the last thing is, I would like a royal commission so that we can then make sure this never happens again. So I'm sitting there as the editor in chief of Sunday Express thinking any one of those three things is highly unlikely. And I said to him, one of those would be success, but all three shame, very, very slight chance. However, if you're willing to do it uh, under the conditions which I set for you, then I'm willing to do it. And the conditions I set for him were. I did not want to give him a pseudonym. I did not want to disguise his identity. I wanted a picture of him as a five-year-old when all of this was happening to him, and I wanted to put it on the paper once the investigation obviously was finished to my satisfaction with all of the true names in it. And then I supplied him with a lawyer uh, who was a former justice minister in Newfoundland, Ed Roberts, and um, led him through the consequences of what might happen to him if he did this. And after a two-hour session with the lawyer, he gave the green light, the story was run, and uh, Newfoundland, which is, as most of you know, it was at that time a denominational society, divided between Roman Catholics and Protestants, um, went crazy. Uh, I had people coming up to me on Easter Sunday, which is the day the story broke, and ironically, my staff was begging me, don't run the story, I won't. Easter Sunday, for God's sake. My answer to that was, we didn't contrive to finish the story on Easter Sunday. We won't contrive to put it up another day. This is the day. And it turned out to be, um, I think, the beginning of the end for that musical game of parishes that uh, the church and the Archdiocese of St. John's was playing in those days. It made a huge difference in cases around the world. The boys of Mount Cashel went to the residential school. Uh, issue being unraveled in all its full tragedy and a lot of other things. So, people making a claim. When I started to do the research for uh, Party of One, I interviewed Preston Manning. And Preston Manning said, the one thing you've got to keep in mind about Stephen Harper is that words don't mean anything to him. And I thought that was an amazing statement. In some ways, as amazing as what Donald Marshall was saying, as amazing as what Shane Earl told me all those years ago in St. John's, Newfoundland, because think about it. If you had a lawyer, if you had a doctor, if you had a financial advisor, if you had a religious and spiritual advisor, and someone told you of that person who knew them well, you got to remember, words don't mean anything. My bet is that nobody would stick with that financial advisor, that lawyer, that doctor, or that spiritual advisor for very long. 
Because the words don't mean anything to people. They cannot be trusted. And so I took what Preston Manning said and I started to think about it. For 10 years, Stephen Harper was at the elbow of Preston Manning. Preston Manning was his mentor. He took him out of the University of Calgary and he hired him as a policy advisor for the uh, then Reform Party. And Manning said at the end of the 10 years, he was as much a stranger at my side as the day he walked into the office. So I started to look at what Stephen Harper did with people and did with language and did with words. And one of the, one of the first things that I looked at was the lie he told to Canadians about the F-35. <clears throat> now we've got people criticizing Thomas Mulcair because he wants to put a, a, a daycare, national daycare system in place, which makes all kinds of sense. Criticize Justin Trudeau for social policies because they're asking where is he going to get the money. But nobody bothered to ask where we were going to get the $15 billion the government was claiming it would cost to buy 65 F-35 stealth fighters. Nobody raised that issue, even though the amount of money was prodigious. But the interesting thing was, it was a complete false number, and the true number was at least double that number. Now that's bad enough that the wrong number was given out to Canadians during an election on such a huge amount of money, $30 billion. But here's where it gets ugly. The cabinet had the right number in 2010. They knew the real cost, and they put out the false cost. They lowballed the number, and they misled everybody. And that is a bad thing to do in a democracy, because how do people exercise an informed vote if they are not given good information by the people who are running the country? You can't do it. Which is why John F. Kennedy once said, you always have to tell the truth in a democracy or it doesn't work. And I say right now, our democracy doesn't work because this guy doesn't give out true information. What he gives out is spin. What he gives out is something that is so close to pathological lying on all the big files, I can't see the difference. And so I looked at the F-35 issue and I thought to myself, bad enough that they lied about the amount of money but in addition to lying about the amount of money, they punished and fired the people who called them on it who were telling the truth. So Kevin Page, who was the parliamentary budget officer, rejects their numbers, and Kevin Page is savagely attacked, not just by Stephen Harper, but by the late Jim Flaherty and other people as an incompetent, as some sort of a political hack who's making their lives difficult, forgetting that the Conservatives created that and they hired Kevin Page. And Kevin Page said to me, Michael, I'm no political operative. I'm just a nerd who doesn't like wasting money. <laughs> That's what he said. <laughs> and then Kevin Page does not get renewed. He gets fired. Then we have Michael Ferguson endorsing the numbers of the discredited but correct parliamentary budget officer. And he finds himself under fire. The conservatives have lied about the issue. <clears throat> The cabinet lied about the issue, and then they punished people who tried to tell the truth. So it gets to be quite, it gets to be quite sinister. Then we have the words they used in the Mike Duffy case. Draw following that. All watch the trial. Watch what's going on. The first reaction from the prime minister about the Mike Duffy affair was, Nigel Wright enjoys my full confidence, and he will not be resigned. Those were his words. Now, important point, he said those words on May 14th when he said he found out about the $90,000. So keep that in mind for a second. He knew on May 14th about the $90,000 check, and yet he said, Michael Wright enjoys my full confidence and won't be resigning. Then the story got to be Nigel Wright and Mike Duffy alone were responsible for this, and no one else in my office knew which of course was another lie. A dozen people knew about it, and it was documented. We have the documents. And I went through them carefully for the book, and now we have more from, from the trial. And when that scenario did not achieve the desired effect, he changed the story again to now say, I fired Nigel Wright because Nigel Wright betrayed and deceived me and isn't fit for 